Dr. Steve Blake, everybody. Dr. Steve Blake. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you. <laughs> okay, do you all remember why you're here? <laughs> We're going to talk about memory today. I authored a clinical trial, and the goal was to use nutrients to combat dementia. It was difficult because there was no drug company writing unlimited checks. And so we all volunteered, everybody on the screen, and lots more. Uh, the clinic rooms are volunteered. Uh, we got volunteered supplements, and um, so we ran it. It took a couple of years uh, from beginning to end, and the paper is now pending publishing in Functional Neurology. I can't guarantee when it'll be out, but it, at least they're peer reviewing it and editing it. Uh, meanwhile, I have um, a book, Nutrients from Memory, that I wrote based on this. So what I'm going to tell you today is what we did in the trial. There's 16 interventions. And uh, I know the scientists argued with me, no, try one molecule. But no, I wanted 16 different ways, each one already proven, to help memory and do them all at once. And so you get to choose which ones or all of the 16 things that you can do. Because all of these things are completely safe. And it's all based on peer-reviewed scientific research. But the big question is, can diet really have anything to do with your mind? Can it affect memory? Can it affect health? I mean, a lot of doctors will tell you, eat what you want, but take my drugs. So let's look at a study here. The MIND diet. The MIND diet is a combination of the Mediterranean diet and an antihypertensive diet to lower blood pressure. And this diet managed to slow the rate of cognitive decline equivalent to seven and a half years. Now, our chief neuropsychologist, Thomas Harding, says that if we can slow dementia by five years, we can cut Alzheimer's disease in half. If we can slow it by 10 years, the epidemic's over. Well, there's seven and a half years right there. And I'll tell you, this diet isn't that great. Really, you can do a lot better. You probably, a lot of you are already doing a lot better than this diet, than the MIND diet. But it's compared to the American diet, it made this huge of a difference. So maybe diet does. You'll notice at the bottom of my screens, there's going to be citations. So this is Alzheimer's and Dementia Journal 2015. And I'll have them on most of my slides. Everything's based on peer-reviewed research. What about green vegetables? There's a Rush Memory and Aging Project, and they used one to two servings of green vegetables a day, the equivalent of being 11 years younger in age on your mental age. So who wants to eat more green vegetables? Besides me. OK. OK, everybody else, I think, should consider eating more green vegetables to keep your brain sharp. There's all kinds of great things in green vegetables. And um, it's a great idea. This is uh, from a 2016 study. What about supplements? Can they help? Well, this study was done with a small amount of the wrong form of vitamin E and a small amount of the wrong form of vitamin C and a little beta carotene. It only ran for four months, but instead of people getting worse, they got better, equivalent to 15% improvement. Now, in contrast, we expect something like a 10% decline over a year with people with mild cognitive impairment, which I'll describe a little more closely in, in a few minutes. So here's a, yet another study. This one shows that at the beginning of the trial, let's see, does this... There's a, a mini mental state exam. Maybe some of you have heard of this. It's a way to assess people's both memory and decision-making abilities. So at the beginning of the trial, we were trying for between 25 and 30 is normal. Between 20 and 25 is mild cognitive impairment. It's more than normal aging memory loss, but not yet dementia. Under 20, that's starting dementia. Well, our group started at 19 on average and finished up nine months later with 29 out of 30. So instead of getting worse, they got a lot better, almost normal. And this is why I use 16 different interventions. I wanted to show it's possible. Later, we'll figure out which thing did more and which thing did less. This little pie chart shows you that dementia is composed of 
not just Alzheimer's disease, but also vascular dementia is a big player. Uh, I know clinically speaking, people with Alzheimer's disease almost always have vascular dementia. What's vascular dementia? It's like tiny strokes that plug a little capillary in the brain and then that kills off a little tree of brain cells and then another little tree gets killed off and another as it gobbles up your ability to think and your memories and who you are this is vascular dementia now speaking at a vegetarian vegan event I can say that if you eat less animal fat in general your cholesterol would be lower and the plaque on your arteries would be less and your chances of vascular dementia would be less how long does it take anywhere from two weeks to two years depending but it doesn't take forever to eliminate the plaque in your arteries, as Caldwell Esselstyn and, and many others have said. This is kind of a sad picture. On the left, you have an, a regular brain, and on the right, you have an Alzheimer's brain in advanced Alzheimer's. The brain is about half as big. It's half as big because half of the cells in the brain have died off. They've died off from vascular dementia, they've died off from toxicity caused by the amyloid plaque. But basically, we don't want to get this far. We'd like to nip it in the bud. And since you all found the auditorium, I'm thinking none of you have advanced Alzheimer's disease. So it's early enough for us all in here. The fuzzball you see between the nerves in the brain, this fuzzball is called amyloid plaque, and it's one of the signature features of Alzheimer's disease. It's found in over 80% of the Alzheimer's cases. It's, they're clumps of protein that don't seem to ever go away. So it would be a good idea, and I'm going to tell you about ways that you can stop producing these fuzzballs that fuzz up your memory. The other signature feature of Alzheimer's disease is tau tangles, or hyperphosphorylated tau, if you like big words. These tau tangles, now doesn't the bottom brain cell look like a fried egg? It really does, kind of. They, they not only eat up the brain cell and eventually kill it, but they also, you notice that the processes, the axons and dendrites, are kind of withered. So the connections between brain cells are not as good as we would like them to be. So we'd like to suppress the production of these two things. The Alzheimer's disease, this is not the incidence of Alzheimer's disease. This, this red line is the mortality of Alzheimer's disease. Did you know it's quite deadly? In 1979, it was 0.3 per 100,000 people. And it went up to 29 in 2016. That's a 9,600% increase. You're going to find out some of the reasons as we go along. In normal aging, you might forget part of an experience, but with dementia, you forget the whole thing. Basically, what I look at dementia is when it really interferes with your life. I mean, you can live with having to make a list before you go to the store. I do that. Uh, so you don't forget things. And that's, that's doable. But when you forget the list, or forget to write the list, or forget where the store is, then that's more dementia. In other words, with dementia, you need help. Um, the conversion rate between mild cognitive impairment, which is not yet dementia, but is more than normal aging memory loss, is usually about 10% per year of people with mild cognitive impairment graduate to dementia. Well, we didn't like that prospect. So here's a more detailed graph. People started at 19 and then over the course of nine months went up to 29. And you'll see in the first three months they were practically normal. Pretty cool, huh? So it really, you really can have an effect on the mind with diet and supplements. We use both. <coughs> so when mild cognitive impairment is diagnosed, and it's kind of a broad range, when we talk to people with mild cognitive impairment, some are almost normal and some are almost into dementia. So there's, there's a, a broad range in there because, well, the brain's already shrunk maybe 10%. Okay, it's shrunk 50% in advanced Alzheimer's disease. Tau tangles are already in the brain and they accumulate much more during that last period. Amyloid plaques are there and 
which people are still able to do what's called the activities of daily living. You know, feeding ourselves, going to the bathroom, dressing ourselves, those are the activities of daily living. And they're not affected in mild cognitive impairment. So we did 16 interventions, and uh, the dietary changes, cup of berries daily, I'm gonna tell you all about these, I'm just gonna list them out, and then I'll tell you about each one. A cup of berries daily, walnuts and sunflower seeds, change cooking methods, and less saturated fat. Can, can anyone name something that has more saturated fat than animal fat? Coconut oil. Coconut oil, right. Got about twice as much saturated fat as lard, and 65% of it are composed of the three saturated fatty acids that clog the arteries, lauric acid, myristic acid, and palmitic acid. If you'd like to know more about fatty acids, I have a book called Fats and Oils Demystified, only available by download, hot off the presses, on my website, drsteveblake.com. It's under 10 bucks, so very affordable, and you can learn all about fats and oils. For supplements, we use four antioxidant minerals. These minerals support our antioxidant enzymes inside our bodies. We used a special form of mixed vitamin E, including the gamma tocopherol, vitamin C, coenzyme Q10, which is naturally made in the body, folate, not folic acid, but the real folate, vitamin B12, SAMe, long name S adenosyl methionine, ginkgo biloba, and go to cola were the two medicinal plants that we used based on really conclusive, peer reviewed medical evidence that they work very well. This, by the way, is a neuroscience nutrition foundation, and we're working to stop Alzheimer's disease. We're working with Parkinson's disease, migraines, other neurologic disorders like MS, ALS, epilepsy, and we're doing it with nutrition. So our website is neurosciencenutrition.org, and we'd appreciate any help you can give us because we're not funded by pharmaceutical companies. It's just us. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate that very much. This is a, uh, a picture from our sailboat in Mexico. And uh, the purpose of it is to rest your eyes and ease your minds. Antioxidants. We hear all about antioxidants. Oh, what are they? There's antioxidants that come from food and antioxidants we make in our bodies. There are two kinds of antioxidants. So the carotenoids in fruits and vegetables are colorful pigments. They're also found in green leafy vegetables. The chlorophyll hides the beautiful yellows and oranges. Vitamin C is found in fruits and vegetables, but not in any animal products. By the way, no carotenoids in any animal products either. Vitamin E in the natural forms is a good antioxidant and polyphenols are wonderful constituents. It's a broad class of plant constituents including flavonoids, flavanols, still beans and all kinds of other excellent anti-inflammatory and antioxidant compounds. Now inside our bodies we make antioxidant enzymes such as glutathione peroxidase and this can turn hydrogen peroxide in our brain, which is a cell killer for sure, into water. But it won't do it without selenium. We also make superoxide dismutase, three different forms. The manganese form protects our brain membranes and the mitochondrial membranes that make energy in our brains. Well, low brain energy is a big part of not thinking well and not mem remembering well. So getting manganese and zinc and copper, these three minerals are essential. If you look at the antioxidant levels in different diets, the standard American diet and the Atkins diet and the transition vegetarian diet were very low, as indicated in red. Now, a transition vegetarian diet would be something like eggs for breakfast, uh, macaroni and cheese for lunch, and some kind of white flour cheesy thing, maybe eggy, for dinner. Not enough vegetables, not enough fruits, not any nuts and seeds, so it's become a diet that is every bit as bad, nutritionally speaking, as a standard American diet, and low in antioxidants. The zone diet, the paleo diet, the South Beach diet, and the Mediterranean diet got enough vitamin C because they include fruits and vegetables. But they didn't do so well with vitamin E or with the carotenoids. In fact, the only diets that really did well were the two plant-based diets, the vegan whole food diet and the vegan raw food diet. They did very well on the antioxidants. 
Talk about vitamin E for a minute. Low vitamin E raised the risk of Alzheimer's disease four times. Now couple that fact with the fact that 93% of Americans aren't even getting the bare minimum of vitamin E, the measly 15 milligrams a day that'll just, just about keep your red blood cells from exploding from lack of antioxidant activity, 93% of Americans. I mean, if that was represented in this auditorium, there would only be about 10 people who actually got enough vitamin E. But I believe in this auditorium, it's the other way around, right? Are we eating our nuts and seeds? Good. So we use one ounce of walnuts and one ounce of sunflower seeds to supply natural tocopherols. The walnuts have gamma tocopherol, the most effective for the brain, and the, the sunflower seeds have the alpha tocopherol. They work together, as, and the vitamin E implants into each cell membrane in the brain. Every neuron gets vitamin E implanted into it. If there's a free radical threatening to kill that brain cell, it neutralizes it. But it can't do it again until vitamin C comes along and recharges it, technically called reducing it. And then it can do it again and again and again. As long as you have vitamin C to recharge it, eventually you're going to need more vitamin E, like every day. By the way, we ground these nuts. The study was conducted in elders. And so the nuts were ground. And that provides better absorption of the vitamin E and other nutrients. It also provides... Um, and some protection from them triggering diverticulosis in diverticuli, bowel pockets, uh, which a lot of old folks have as a consequence of eating low fiber foods all their life. Many studies are showing that the gamma tocopherol is protective against Alzheimer's disease. Unfortunately, most of the studies looking at vitamin E are using a synthetic alpha tocopherol. And to say it's a, kind of a pet peeve of mine is putting it mildly. The synthetic alpha tocopherol is, first of all, just alpha, not beta, delta, gamma tocopherols. And secondly, only one-eighth of it is the real alpha tocopherol. Seven-eighths of the synthetic alpha tocopherol is worthless. So what you're getting is you're getting synthetic alpha tocopherol going up to your brain, implanting in a brain cell membrane, and not protecting it against free radical damage. So in a sense, it may be worse than nothing to, to do the uh, alpha tocopherol, which is found in the vast majority of supplements. I, I actually made brain and body food, and this I made for people at our clinic that were not in the trial, and I managed to put in the real vitamin E, and it costs as much as everything else in the bottle. And this is why manufacturers don't put in the real vitamin E. But we did supply 500 milligrams of vitamin E as mixed tocopherols, about the same amount as in the brain and body food, uh, during our trial. And I think that, coupled with the nuts and seeds, by the way, walnuts are really neat. They not only have the gamma form of tocopherol, but they also have the uh, omega-3, plant-based omega-3, alpha-linolenic acid. And it's rare for things to have both of those. Now, vitamin C, people with Alzheimer's disease, they check their levels. The dementia group was three times more likely to have low vitamin C levels than the people without dementia. So we added 800 milligrams of vitamin C daily. Vitamin C is really fascinating stuff. Um, did I mention I wrote a college textbook from McGraw-Hill called Vitamins and Minerals Demystified? I did, and in that book I talk a lot about vitamin C and most animals make vitamin C in their bodies. It's a four-step enzymatic process, but humans don't have that last enzyme, so we can't do it. So I looked at all the other animals. How much did they make in their bodies? Nature isn't wasteful. And it turns out all the other animals standardized to 150 pound, 70 kilogram person, made great between 2,000 and 20,000 milligrams of vitamin C a day. And even the very best vegan diet, very plant-based, isn't likely to get over 400 milligrams of vitamin C. So hence, we added 800, and I put 1,200 in the brain and body food. Studies looking at people who are taking supplements are showing that very much less dementia with people taking vitamin C and vitamin E than people who are not. Ah, oh, we get another break. This is Catherine, my wife, and um, that's a Jenniker. The nurse's health study. They looked at uh, 20,000 women for about 20 years. 
And they found that those women who ate a cup of berries a day delayed dementia by an average of two years. That's really significant. There isn't a drug in the world that can do that. Uh, Donna Pezzel, not a chance. Everybody gets it, but it doesn't seem to help much. It has a type of proanthocyanidins that can be, depending on pH, either red or blue or kind of black. And these proanthocyanidins are found to travel past the blood-brain barrier into the memory areas of the brain and, like guards, stand there and prevent inflammation and oxidation of brain cells. In other words, prevent death of brain cells. And inflammation of brain cells is a really big thing because when your brain is inflamed, the, glea, the microglia, the immune system of the brain, sees damaged brain cells and kills them off. And the more inflammation, the more glia, and the more brain cells are killed off, and that's how Alzheimer's progresses, also vascular dementia. So we supplied one cup of either blueberries, strawberries, or red, or blue, or black grapes, but not the green ones. The green ones don't have proanthocyanidin, so uh, they, they were ruled out. Now you can do this at home. It's easy. How many people are already eating berries every day? Fantastic. Really good. So I say keep it up, and anybody who didn't raise their hand, uh, might consider doing this. It's certainly delicious. I would recommend organic berries because berries are in the, what they call the dirty dozen where they spray right on the face of the berries and it's probably not good for your brain to get pesticides in it. Uh, I do a lot of talks on Parkinson's disease and it's closely related with uh, certain brain cells dying uh, as a result of pesticide exposure. So you're going to need copper, zinc, and manganese, and also selenium, the four minerals you need to support your antioxidant minerals. Now, there's several ways of doing this. You can just eat whatever you like and hope that you're getting them. Or you can eat a careful diet, analyze your diet. I have software called the Diet Doctor that analyzes you know, protein, vitamins, minerals, these four minerals, and everything else, tocopherols, carotenoids, all that good stuff. Um, you can analyze your diet, but I found a lot of people don't like to analyze their diet, so what I do is I take the brain and body foods and make sure I get all those minerals every day in the right form and in the right amount. Trace minerals are not good to take too much or too little of. You have to take just the right amount and just the right form. Cellular energy is really important in keeping our brain sharp. All our little mitochondria, the little energy factories in every cell have to be working well. And what really protects them is the manganese form of superoxide dismutase. So make sure especially that you get enough manganese. I don't know if I have that. I don't have the graph here. But if you look at the amount of manganese on an Atkins diet or a paleo diet, it's just a tiny little bit compared to what you need every day. So in other words, some diets are very low in manganese. So yeah, during our study, we supplied these four minerals. I want to make sure the yellow outlines what we gave people in our study so you can kind of get an idea. And you also, um, we just have a few copies of my brand new off the presses book, Nutrients for Memory. And it's about the Hawaii Dementia Prevention Trial, everything we did, why we did it, and, uh, and how it worked. So kind of a longer version of this talk. Coenzyme Q10 is made in every cell in our bodies. And it's made in a pathway very similar to cholesterol. Unfortunately, cholesterol-lowering drugs like statins or hydroxymethylglutaryl coenzyme A reductase inhibitors, to use the long name, uh, they inhibit the formation of mevalonate and farnesyl, so you can't make enough cholesterol and you can't make enough coenzyme Q10. Well, lowering cholesterol is a good side effect, and lowering coenzyme Q10 is a very bad side effect. Estimated that 40% less coenzyme Q10 is made in people who take statins. By the way, in a healthy group like this, how many people are proud to say they don't need statins because they eat healthy? How many people? Come on, raise them up. Are you proud? Well, it's got to be more than that. Come on, who doesn't take statins? Okay, well, I'm only seeing about 75%. I mean, I had, a, I had a crowd with more people raising their hands in Cape Cod a week ago. Um, but I suspect some people may be shy because I think in this crowd, it's so easy to control cholesterol with diet that you wouldn't need the statins. And certainly you can lower your cholesterol easily enough. Now, coenzyme Q10 has two functions. 
first of all, it's the only fat-soluble antioxidant made in the human body. That makes it just crucial for protecting cell membranes like brain cell membranes and mitochondrial cell membranes. The second function is that it is essential to make aerobic energy. It works in the electron transport chain and you simply can't make energy without it. So good thing to have. Now as we age, uh, we make maybe a little less coenzyme Q10. Coenzyme Q10 has been used in lots of studies. It's very well tolerated. It's natural to the human body and it doesn't seem to have any toxicity. Uh, you can even buy chewable tablets. Uh, so it's something that we added 200 milligrams of CoQ10 every day and it reduced the production of amyloid plaques and reduced oxidation in the brain in a study in Journal of Molecular Neuroscience. Ah, here we go, another brain break. This is Flat Rock Pool and it's about a five minute walk from our organic farm in Maui. And uh, when my brain steams up from too much research, I dunk it in this pool and it comes out clean. <laughs> I want to talk about advanced glycation end products. Who's heard of these? Advanced glycation end products? Not too many people, less than 10% of this crowd. Um, so what they are is they form when protein and sugars come together. So there's two ways they can form. One is when things are cooked like meat, chicken or fish are cooked by broiling or barbecuing or frying until they're brown. This forms these advanced glycation end products. They also are formed in cheese. They're not found in milk, but when it's aged, the sugars and the proteins get together in cheese. So we ruled out hard cheeses in our trial. Now, the people in our trial were anything but vegan. So, you know, I would have liked to rule out all dairy products, but instead we just ruled out hard cheeses. And that effect, I think, was beneficial, uh, even, you know, s short steps along the path. They're very important uh, oxidative stress. So these, they also, oh, the other way they can be formed, advanced glycation end products, is when your blood sugar goes too high, such as in diabetes. When the blood sugar is too high, the sugars and the hemoglobin will glycate together and form advanced glycation end products measured by the A1C test, and that's how they test long-term problems in diabetes. So good idea to avoid sugar spikes as well as these foods. So where are they found? Okay, chicken, bacon, beef, chicken, chicken, beef, chicken, chicken, beef, chicken, turkey, chicken. You get the idea. Uh, so Kentucky Fried might not sound so good uh, when you consider the advanced glycation end products. What they do is they go, some of them, the shorter ones, go through the intestine into the bloodstream where they go up to the brain and there's a receptor called RAGE, isn't that a good name? Receptor for advanced glycation end products. Simply entering the brain triggers a cascade of inflammation and then it gets bad. Then the advanced glycation end products go up to the amyloid plaques and lodge with the other proteins there and shower the brain with 50 times as much radiation-like free radical damage to brain cells forever. Good idea not to eat these things, which is why we cut them out of the diets and we reduce dietary AGEs by limiting barbecuing, broiling, deep frying, and hard cheeses. By the way, if you're going to make a shish kebab with vegetables and tofu, don't worry, it won't form advanced glycation end products. The water interrupts the last stage of the process. Oh, you get another peaceful one. This is in the Sea of Cortez at sunset. A very peaceful ocean. I'm going to talk about how amyloid plaques are formed in the brain. It's a little bit of science here, but it's good stuff. So we start off with, this is a cell membrane here, and here's the amyloid precursor protein. And we have beta secretase and gamma secretase. These are the players in the game. The beta and gamma secretase snip off this amyloid precursor protein and it becomes those awful fuzzballs known as amyloid plaques. What if we could reduce the production of the beta and gamma secretase enzymes? Well, that's just what we did in this study. Vitamin B12, 
which if you're vegan and not taking a B12 supplement, you're going to be very low in this, at least eventually. Uh, it may take three to seven years before clinical signs erupt, but please don't wait so long and keep that B12 going. Vitamin B12 and folate, which is one of the eight B vitamins, get together and they transform a harmful blood chemical called homocysteine, which you may have seen on your blood test, into s methionine, which I'm going to call SAM-E because it's kind of hard to say. SAM-E then travels to the cells like this one, like this one, and it quenches the genes epigenetically quenches the genes by methylation so they don't produce beta and gamma secretase so you don't make more amyloid plaques. Isn't that great? So we don't want more of these fuzzballs clogging up our brain. So a good idea to make sure that you get enough vitamin B12 and folate. Uh, I think it's really essential. Okay, um, so this is kind of how it works. If you get enough folate and vitamin B12 and your cholesterol is low, that helps too. Then you have low homocysteine, more SAMe, very few secretase enzymes, no amyloid plaque buildup. And the opposite is the bad thing. Uh, Alzheimer's disease is really awful. And it's much worse for the caretakers than it is for the person having it. Almost comparable to an alcoholic, where the family suffers and the guy's kind of happy. Well, <laughs> uh, with Alzheimer's disease, it's really rough on the caretakers. Often die before the person with Alzheimer's disease. When we looked at SAMe levels in the cerebrospinal fluid, in Alzheimer's disease patients, it was severely low. So it's all depleted. So it can't quench those genes, and it, it can't stop the production of amyloid plaques. Also helped with tau tangles. Enough SAMe slowed the production of tau tangles. So both of the signature features of Alzheimer's disease were slowed and maybe could be stopped with a couple of B vitamins. Now, we did also supply 200 milligrams of SAM-E itself. SAM-E is a safe, natural component of the human body. Uh, there is one drug interaction, um, which really has a good side to it. SAM-E is an antidepressant. It makes you happy. We had people take it in the morning so they wouldn't be too happy at night. But if you're on Prozac or any kind of antipsychotic medication, you should not take SAMe because you might get a smile that's just too big and silly all the time. <laughs> you need to be a little careful with mixing your meds there. Uh, so th just a precaution. So we screen people out of our study who are on antipsychotic medication. High levels of homocysteine are really bad. They're bad, for, of course, for heart attack risk, but they're also uh, bad for dementia. Four times the risk of dementia and Alzheimer's disease in particular. Patients with a level of folate tripled their risk of vascular dementia and Alzheimer's disease. So what do we do? We supplied 240 micrograms of vitamin B12 in the methylcobalamin form and also 600 milligrams, micrograms, excuse me, of folate in the folate form, not the folic acid form. Folic acid can lead to cancer problems if you get over a thousand micrograms a day and since it's fortified in a lot of grains breakfast cereals and other things it's really good not to take any extra folic acid and if you look on your vitamin pill it'll probably say folic acid because it's cheaper we actually had that contract with a german pharmaceutical company to get the best folate for brain and body food losing gray matter in your brain not if you get enough folate and vitamin B12. The green line shows what happens if they got enough folate and vitamin B12. No loss. But without it, there was loss of gray matter. So you really need to make sure you get these. Folate can be found, is named after foliage. So in green leafy vegetables, greens and beans are the sources of folate. You can get plenty of that. Um, basically greens and beans, nuts and seeds, plant foods. But folate levels on an American diet, look at this graph. They're supposed to get this much, but they only got this much because Americans don't eat their vegetables, right? Vitamin B12 is a tough one for anyone to get enough. Clinically speaking, most people with low vitamin B12 eat plenty of meat. They get plenty of vitamin B12 in their diet, but vitamin B12 is a large complex molecule that requires the intrinsic factor to be made in the stomach and the parietal cells, the same cells that make hydrochloric acid, the same cells that get really damaged and depleted over a lifetime of eating junk food and animal food. So people who get enough in their diet often need vitamin B12 supplements. 
well, people who don't eat animal products also need vitamin B12, so I'd recommend you seriously consider getting some vitamin B12, no matter what you eat. If you did get enough folate and vitamin B12, you could cut your risk to one quarter. Now that's interesting because a genetic risk is usually about four times higher than it would normally be. And just these two safe, simple B vitamins, no upper limit for either folate or vitamin B12, very safe, very cheap, can cut your risk back down if you happen to have a genetic risk for it. This is Twin Falls. This is a 10 minute walk from our organic farm in Maui and my wife drew this picture for the cover of my book, Healing Medicine. I, I paid her, I did. <laughs> it's worth it, isn't it pretty? I wanna talk a little bit about cholesterol. A large Finnish study started in middle age and they followed these people all the way through old age. If their cholesterol was low at midlife, if it wasn't low at midlife, they were three times as likely to get Alzheimer's disease. So any of you folks in here who are younger than old should also keep your cholesterol levels nice and low. Something like around 150 uh, milligrams per deciliter of total cholesterol would be great. Uh, down around there, that would be really ideal. They say the heart attack proof zone is below 150. Uh, perhaps over time that would be literally true. Now, lowering cholesterol, of course, means that you're going to have less of the amyloid plaques because cholesterol inhibits the production of those two enzymes. you remember the two enzymes? It in gamma secretase. Okay, we have no quizzes here. Um, anyway, so it's great to keep your cholesterol low, like as in vegan, because then you're going to make less gamma and beta secretase and less amyloid plaques, those fuzzballs that clog up our brains. So what we did in HADAPT was we limited the diets of people to 7% of their calories as saturated fat. Now what that means is they can have a little bit of animal products, but not much, because you can go over very quickly. This was, had very poor compliance in our study group, which was made of people who had no, I had probably never heard the word vegan. It was really tough on the dietitians. They, they really worked hard to get people to eat less animal fat and uh, coconut oil was excluded from the diet entirely because of the saturated fat as well. Okay, we got another, another sailing picture to relax your minds. I wanna talk about a couple of plants we used. I searched the world's literature for over 35 years and made a database of herbal knowledge called the Herb Doctors with information from 54 countries and regions worldwide with 168,000 footnoted facts and there are hundreds and hundreds of plants that help with memory. But what I did then was I searched the biomedical literature and found two plants with the best the gold-plated medical studies are placebo-controlled, double-blind, randomized trials. And nine of them show that ginkgo biloba, shown here, help both in delaying the onset of Alzheimer's and in treating it. Now, what do they mean by treating it? That means that the people with Alzheimer's disease got better instead of worse. Can that really happen? We worked with a lady named Cora, and she first came in a, to the clinic in a wheelchair, and I asked her, Cora, what did you have for breakfast this morning? No response, just none. It was a stumper of a question for her. It was only two in the afternoon. She really couldn't get that far back in her mind. Cora was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease and every month we worked with her and her daughter was amazing. She did what we suggested. Much to the chagrin of her family of three and 400 pound guys who really wanted their meat every meal. So she did basically what we're doing in the study here. She wasn't included in the study because she couldn't qualify. She was just under 65. Um, but she took the brain and body food and she did the dietary changes. And over time, she came in on a walker and then she came in on a, chain, on a cane. Then she forgot her cane. And, and it was, when she was on the walker, she said, my knees are so swollen and inflamed and they hurt and I have osteoarthritis and it's horrible. 
And I said, would you like to try giving up turkey, chicken, and eggs so you don't get arachidonic acid so much? And so then you're not going to produce all these inflammatory leukotrienes. And her ginger said, okay. And mom didn't have much to say about it, poor dear. But she benefited because the inflammation went down when she stopped eating. Now, arachidonic acid is exactly what aspirin blocks. And almost every NSAID works by blocking arachidonic acid from being processed by lipoxygenase into hydroproxy eicosatetraenoic acid and then into inflammatory leukotrienes and painful prostaglandins. So instead of eating this, the arachidonic acid and blocking it with painkillers, she cut down the arachidonic acid. I think a very effective treatment. I have a book on arthritis called Arthritis Relief that I wrote and I integrate this along with the other ways of reducing inflammation. What was really great was that at the end of two years, we had a cl new clinic dedication, and she walked with no cane up to the front and faced 100 white-coated doctors and told them about her experiences and said, I'm now reading medical studies. That's great. So just to say, yes, you can actually get better. Her amyloid plaques probably didn't disappear but her vascular dementia probably got a lot better. And, um, okay, she was eating all fast food at the beginning, so that was a real problem. And then she actually got some nutrition, and that really helped. Okay, back to ginkgo here. Um, ginkgo really helps. It thins the blood, and it's an antioxidant, and it stops the cell death induced by amyloid plaque. One problem with thinning the blood is that some people are already taking blood thinners, such as people who have had strokes or heart attacks. So if people were taking in the study Coumadin or Pradaxa, Xeralto, Eliquis, any of the blood thinners, then they disqualified for the study. And if you're taking any blood thinners, then you should not take ginkgo biloba because your blood might get too thin and that could lead to bruising or bleeding. They did a test on Donapezil versus ginkgo biloba. Now, donapezil is a standard treatment for memory loss. And so they put ginkgo biloba up against it, and it worked just as well in a half-year randomized placebo-controlled double-blind study with 60 elder patients with mild to moderate Alzheimer's, as did donapezil. But donapezil, especially in the 10 to 20 milligram dose range, causes horrible nausea and vomiting. But the ginkgo biloba didn't. In fact, it's very protective of brain cells. And they also checked, what if you took donapezil, which everybody's already taking anyway, and then added ginkgo biloba, biloba to it, with both, memory scores improved. One point in six months, two points in 12 months for a 7% improvement. But with just donapezil, they went down 5%. So it helped even on people who are already taking donapezil. So perhaps ginkgo, if you're not on blood thinners, is something you could consider taking. We used the, where does it say, the standardized extract, 160 milligrams. The standardized extract's really important because it allows you to get the exact same in every capsule because leaves vary in their potency. Now, uh, gota cola was the other plant that we used, uh, been used in Ayurvedic remedies forever. Uh, really nice plant, no contraindications at all. It's an antioxidant, scavenges free lipid radicals, and reduces lipid peroxidation. It lowered amyloid plaque in the hippocampus, a memory area of the brain. That's phenomenal. Everybody thought there was no way to lower amyloid plaque. Two month study found that gam the Gota Cola capsules improved the score on the mini mental state exam from 25 to 28. Well, that may be three of those, those points that we got of the 10 that, that improved on our test. So I'm sure it contributed. So we used 300 milligrams of Gota Cola extract. So now you have heard what we did. So now you can choose what you want to do. This is up to you. Berries and grape juice improve memory. So those of you who are not eating berries and dark grapes every day, please consider that. There's a disappearing grape trick. Here's what you do. You pull the grapes off the stem and put them in a cup. And you put the cup next to your chair. And then a half hour later, you look at the cup and it's empty. <laughs> Vitamin E cut the risk to one half, vitamin C to one eighth. 
if it were their couple together. So you can eat a lot of fruits and vegetables. You can eat your walnuts and sunflower seeds and other nuts and seeds that have them. What are the two nuts that don't have vitamin E? Coconut and macadamia nuts. But I still eat macadamia nuts for fun, even though I know they have no vitamin E. Coenzyme Q10 and SAMe can be very helpful. You could consider that if you're having memory problems. SAMe, remember, not with psychoactive medication. Uh, CoQ10 seems safe. There's four minerals that support our own antioxidant systems. And who can name all four? Be besides my wife. Okay. Selenium, zinc, copper, and manganese. Those are the four that you're going to need. Uh, folate and vitamin B12 can cut risk of one quarter. Two cheap, safe B vitamins can cut your risk of Alzheimer's disease to one quarter. And this is through epigenetic methylation and quenching of the genes that make the, the enzymes that make the amyloid plaques. Ginkgo biloba and go to cola are two things to consider. Now the little bombshells are things that might be bad to do, such as advanced glycation end products, two to three times higher in Alzheimer's disease patients. So of course if you avoid all animal products and cheese, then you naturally won't get any advanced glycation end products. But even if you do, and people in our study would not quit, then at least we got them to use different cooking methods, steaming, steaming boiling, poaching, to at least reduce the advanced glycation end products. Animal fat at least doubles risk, and vascular dementia, I think it increases it even more. And high blood cholesterol definitely raises risk. Remember, with high blood cholesterol, you're making more amyloid plaques all the time. So this is my rather complicated, rather complete, multifaceted intervention for Alzheimer's disease. What do you say? Thank you. Thank you very much.